Lord Jesus Christ who purchased that forgiveness. Amen. For hundreds of years, people of God had been eagerly awaiting the arrival of the king, the descendant of David, who would come and sit on David's throne and set up his divine kingdom. And when that king finally arrived, he preached a sermon that would become the most famous sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. The topic of this sermon is righteousness. This whole sermon is about righteousness, specifically what righteousness now looks like in this new kingdom. He began with some instructions about the role of the law in the sermon, and then for the rest of chapter 5 is all about righteousness and relationships. What does a righteous man in this kingdom look like when it deals with when it comes to dealing with people, interacting in relationships with other people. And then in uh, the first part of chapter 6, he moved to righteousness and religion. What does righteousness look like in this kingdom when it comes to dealing with God and acts of religious observance like praying and giving and fasting and all that? Then at the end of chapter 6, it was righteousness and resources or possessions. What does righteousness look like in a, in a man who, when it comes to money and stuff? And that's where we left off last week. Now we begin chapter 7, and Jesus moves on to a new subject, righteousness and sinners. In this kingdom, what does righteousness look like when it comes to dealing with sinners? And Jesus begins with a very negative thing. He tells us what not to do. Verse 1, do not judge. So Jesus' teaching when it comes to judging is don't. Don't do it. You are not to judge. The king comes, preaches about his kingdom, and he says, in this kingdom you are not to judge each other. What does that mean? I can, I can tell you what our culture wants it to mean. Matthew 7, 1 is, is almost a mantra in this culture. Judge not, lest you be judged. Who are you to judge? Don't ever pass judgment. Our, our, our culture, we live in a culture that hates all moral evaluation. And so they would take Jesus' words here and push them to an absolute extreme. Just shut off your brain altogether when it comes to ethics and don't make any distinctions at all. Don't ever say anything is wrong. Don't ever say anything is evil or sin. Don't ever use the word ought when it comes to moral things. Any kind of obligation morally is just accept Everyone, as they are, unconditionally, and don't even so much as believe that something that somebody does is wrong. That's really the spirit of our age, isn't it? And it's not surprising. It, 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 if you have a whole culture of people who want to ignore God and ignore his word and his law and just do whatever they please, the last thing that that culture is going to want is anybody walking around making any kind of moral distinctions and reminding them that they are rebelling against the Holy One. But is this what Jesus is really saying? Just completely shut your brain down altogether when it comes to morals? No, that's not. We know for sure that's not what he's saying because of what he says in the end in verse 6 there. He warns us about people who are dogs and pigs. And then later he tells us, watch out for false prophets too, and we'll know them by their fruit. So obviously we have to be able to discern who are the dogs and the pigs and the false prophets. In fact, in other contexts, Jesus commands us to judge. He uses the same word, John 7, 24. Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. We're commanded to judge, Matthew 18. Chapter 18 and verse 15, he says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Not only do you judge him to be in the wrong, but you confront him about it. We had somebody visit our church who was very alarmed when they found out we were carrying out church discipline, and she said, I don't think you should do that. Uh, you should just love everybody. Well, Leviticus 19.17 says, Do not hate your brother in your heart. Don't hate your brother. You say, how's that? Rebuke your neighbor, frankly, so that you will not share in his guilt. Don't hate him. Rebuke him. You see that? She thought, this woman thought that loving everybody means don't rebuke, but Jesus says, 
If you, or the, or the law of God says, if you fail to rebuke your brother, that is not an act of love, that is an act of hatred. Scripture's loaded with commands that we make, all kinds of judgments. 1 John 4, 1, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Philippians 3, 2, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil. All the times in Scripture we're warned about the, our responsibility to make judgments. We are to pass judgments. Those people who say that we should judge nothing, that's, they're, they're holding to a self-refuting belief. It's one, of those, it's one of those easiest things to refute. If I'm judging everyone, if I'm going around judging, and they point to me and tell me that I'm wrong, they determine that I'm wrong for judging, what are they doing? They're judging me. They make the judgment that all judgment is wrong, and in their judgment, nobody should make judgments because, because they judge all judgments to be judgmental, except for their passing judgment on my judgment. <laughs> it's the same double standard, hypocritical, self-refuting error that the postmodern people always make when they try and say that there's no absolutes. I always want to ask those people, are you absolutely sure? They are absolutely sure that there's nothing we can be sure of, and they rule out all rulemaking, and they speak out against speaking out, and they pass judgment on all judging. They're the height of hypocrisy. They're exactly what Jesus is talking about with the log in their own eye. Jesus is calling for graciousness here, not blindness. To look at something God calls sin and pretend it's not sin, is that is... Blindness, it is connected in Ephesians 4 with infantile immaturity. Uh, Ephesians 4.14 describes undiscerning people as being like infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching. That's a bad thing. That's not a good thing. Discernment and judgmentalism are not the same thing. It's never wrong to just simply repeat something that God has said. Right? I mean, you understand that, right? If the, power, if the powers that be uh, pass a law, they say it's, it's, it's against the law to, to drive 60 miles an hour in a school zone. And you're riding with me in my car, and we're going 60 miles an hour through a school zone, and you lean over and say, hey, Daryl, that's uh, against the law. You're not passing judgment. You're just, you're not legislating anything. You're not creating any law. You're just relaying information to me. Right? If I go out and pronounce stealing is wrong. I'm not passing any judgment on anything. I, God has already passed that judgment on stealing. All I'm doing is passing along the information. So it's never sinful judging if all you're doing is accurately relaying uh, information about what God has already said, a judgment that God has already pronounced. In fact, think about this. If you fail to do that, if you fail to accurately pass along what God has said about sin, that's a form of sinful judging. Here's why. If God says someone is guilty, God says anyone who does that is guilty, and then we come along and hide that information from that person and make that person think that he's okay and what he's doing is perfectly okay and he's, all, he's fine with God, then we're acting like we are a higher court overturning the judgment that God made in his lower court on that thing. We're passing judgment on God. So if I stand up here and preach Abortion is murder. Homosexual, homosexual behavior is sin. It's perverse. And the world says, who are you to judge? My answer is, I'm nobody, n and nor am I judging. Those things are not evil because of my opinions. They're evil. Anything is evil or good only if God says it's evil or good. And all I'm doing is letting you know what he said in his word. You disagree with it, your argument is with him. So all that to make, and that's a good rule of thumb on judging, by the way, is if you can always say, if you disagree, your argument is not with me. I didn't make this judgment. God did. So all that to say what Jesus isn't saying. 
He's not forbidding evaluations. He's not forbidding all distinctions, all judgments, all discernment. On the other hand, though, he is forbidding something. And I think that's important for us to realize, because in a church like Agape, where we have a high regard for discernment and and passing along God's judgments that he's made accurately, and we we don't want to neglect that, and we're careful about that. In a church like this, we run the risk of going off the road on the other side into judgmentalism, which is what Jesus is forbidding here. We don't want to just look at what he's not saying and just breathe a sigh of relief and go on our merry way passing judgment on everybody all the time because the behavior that Jesus forbids here is very serious matter. It's a very serious sin, and he gives us a severe threat. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. Now that should make us tremble. Just let that sink in. The prospect of being judged by God for sin should be the most terrifying threat imaginable to us if we believe God is who he says he is. Nothing is worse than having God unhappy with you. Nothing. If we are ever able to read something like verse 1 with a ho-hum attitude without it just rattling us to the core, that is an indication that our understanding of God has shriveled down to such a low level that it borders on blasphemy. I can confess to you, nothing concerns me more about my own spiritual life than how little emotional fear strikes my heart when I read about Judgment Day. Because when the Lord threatens us with judgment, that is, a, that is a, if we believe, that's a very, very serious matter. Jesus is speaking to believers here, and he warns them about being judged. If you've been taught that forgiveness of sins that you received when you became a Christian somehow exempts you from Judgment Day altogether, you need to reread Romans 14, verse 10. It says, You therefore, why do you judge your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue confess to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, stop passing judgment on one another. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, so we make it our goal to please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Just as all of his promises of reward that we, we read in chapter 6 should motivate us, so should his threats of punishment motivate us, if we believe. If we're judgmental, towards others in a sinful way, we will pay a very steep price for that on Judgment Day. You're at odds with another Christian? You're holding a grudge? You're looking down on somebody? You're not just going to float into eternity without that being dealt with, right? God is going to make that right. If it doesn't get taken care of before you die, it will be set right on Judgment Day. Everything you've said or done that has been wrong or unfair uh, in, that, in, in this whole relationship between you and this person is going to be brought to light and is going to be made right. The Lord promised to vindicate all those who have been mistreated. And that's a wonderful promise when we're mistreated, right? It's a scary promise when we're mistreating Someone else. Because God is going to make it right. And whatever role, wherever, however you've been involved uh, as the perpetrator, that's going to be exposed. And believe me, whatever discomfort you might experience right now by humbling yourself with that person and making it right will be nothing compared to what it'll be like on Judgment Day if you wait till then. You do not want to arrive at Judgment Day and have God straightening out injustices that you created and did not repent of. However, I should also say this. I don't see any foundation here for restricting this just to the final judgment. I think it also applies in this life. In this life, judgment comes to us 
from God in the form of discipline and training and chastisement. Uh, the Corinthians, for example, were, remember they were carrying out communion in a way that wasn't pleasing to God. And uh, the result was he judged them with chastisement. 1 Corinthians 11.30. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. God disciplined them by causing them to get sick and some of them to die. And then verse 31. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. So there he used the word judgment to refer to is chastisement in this life. You see, every single time we sin, God has a choice to make. Should I be patient again, or should I bring some hard consequences this time? That's the choice he's faced with every time we sin. And he will always choose whichever one is ultimately in our best interest. But when we're critical and judgmental towards others, we create a situation in which the best thing for God to do is usually to deal harshly with us. You see that? So you say, okay, well, what is it that's forbidden here? If it's not, if it's not what the kind of thing the world is saying, what is it? What is sinful judgmentalism? Um, so serious that we're, Jesus is threatening judgment from God then every person who loves the Lord and fears the Lord should be eager to know what is Jesus prohibiting here. Because we know we're supposed to use doctrinal discernment. We know, we know we're supposed to call a spade a spade when it comes to something that the Bible says is sin. So what are we not allowed to do? What is the bad kind of judging? The, answer, the most obvious answer to that, if you just look at the text here, is uh, the, most, the, well, the sinful kind of judging is when you judge hypocritically. In verses 3 to 5, he's going to talk about when you have a, 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 you're trying to look at a speck in your neighbor's eye, some fault in your neighbor, and, and you get a log in your own eye, and, uh, and that's hypocritical judging. But, so that's one kind of bad judging, but I'm, I'm going to hold off on talking about that until we get to verse 3. For now, we're in verse 1, and I think it would be good to remind ourselves of just the overall context of Scripture when it comes to what would come to mind to those people when Jesus said, don't judge, what, what, what are the various ways that you can sin by judging the wrong way? And we're going to get a clinic on that this morning. Uh, the people that are going to put this clinic on are the Pharisees. They are masters at wrong judgment. They're excellent at it, and Jesus is forever rebuking them for rendering wrong judgments time after time. So let's just take a few minutes to learn from Jesus' words to the Pharisees about the various wrong kinds of judging. When I look at the Pharisees and the hypocrites in the Gospels, the first thing I see, the main thing that I see about the way that they judged wrongly was they judged legalistically. So that's the first one in our list. It's sinful to judge legalistically. When they judged people, they had their own human traditions that they had set up mixed together with the law of God. So you couldn't even distinguish which is which. They didn't distinguish which is which. Just like the Roman Catholic Church today with their church tradition. Each time you see the Pharisees making wrong judgments, uh, it's usually because somebody was violating not the law of God, but their own traditions, their human traditions. For example, in Matthew 12, they passed judgment on Jesus and the disciples for violating their traditions uh, on the Sabbath. And Jesus says in verse 7, If you would read the law, you would have not condemned the innocent. If you just read God's word, if you read the Bible, you wouldn't have condemned the innocent. That's wrong judging, right? Condemning the innocent? That's some bad judgment. So mark this. This is important. Nobody is ever required to do anything that God does not require them to do. Got that? Nobody is ever required to do anything that God does not require them to do. We're not at liberty to add requirements. When we add requirements to God's Word and we look down on people for not meeting our requirements, we are guilty of legalism. Whenever people do that, whenever people, inevitably, when they set up a legalistic system, they always set themselves up on the throne of that system and pass judgment on everybody uh, according to their own self-styled rules. Those of us who have grown up in the church, in a, in a godly culture, tend to be offenders in this area because we just have certain lists of things that we've just always thought of as bad. There, there are things that our parents have told us are bad, and we've always thought they're bad, and even though none of them are mentioned in the Bible, 
we see someone doing those things and we look down on that person as like a second class citizen, second class Christian. If you look down on somebody because they're smoking or drinking uh, or they got a tattoo or they're wearing leather and chains or their hairstyle rubs you the wrong way or whatever, that's legalism. It's legalism. And I'm guessing that most of you were just fine with that principle right up until I gave that example. As soon as I start giving specific examples, you realize this is not really a simplistic issue. This is a complex issue because every one of those things I mentioned, there are serious spiritual problems connected with every one of those things. There are a lot of ways you can sin by smoking a cigarette or drinking a beer or getting a tattoo or even by wearing leather. Uh, if you do that as an expression of rebellion, or if you want to identify, you do that because you want to identify with a godless culture, godless people, or if it becomes some kind of controlling, enslaving habit, or if it's poor stewardship in your life, or if it jeopardizes a weaker, weaker brother's faith, or a host of other dangers, then those things become real sins. And so there's problems with those things. So what do we do with that kind of stuff? Things that might become sin. Well, how are we to handle that? Well, when something's not specifically prohibited in Scripture, but it is fraught with a lot of spiritual danger, then each one of us have to apply wisdom in our own particular lives, in our own particular case, to make a judgment call on how to handle those things in a way that is most profitable for the kingdom. And we're all making these judgment calls. And the key phrase there is judgment call. Exactly how much is too much? In, in what context is it sin, and in what context is it not sin? We all have to make our judgment calls in those areas, because, uh, and, and that judgment call is very, very important, because if you violate your judgment call, is that sin? Yes. It most certainly is sin. If I decide that in my case, my judgment call is, well, the best course for me, best course of action is um, no, no alcohol at all, no drinking alcohol then for me, it is a sin to drink. It's always, always, always sin to go against your conscience, to violate your conscience, do anything that you, your conscience doesn't believe is right. Romans 14.5, Romans 14.22, Romans 14.23. That is sin. So everyone must follow their conscience on judgment call issues. But what about people who make a different judgment call than you? If the judgment call they make on their lives is less strict than yours, they, they just feel more freedom to go further than you will feel to go. The temptation is to make the judgment call that you made for your life uh, um, uh, binding on them. And... So you enforce your judgments on them. That, that's a very natural thing to do. We all do that. Y you say no to some enticing thing for Christ's sake. You kind of want this thing. It would bring some pleasure. But you say, no, I'm going to sacrifice that for Christ's sake. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to indulge in it. And then you see some other Christian brother fully indulging in that thing. It's very natural to question that guy's devotion to Christ. Natural. But wrong. Sinful. It's legalistic judging. Maybe it is a sin for him, just like it is for you, but maybe not. You don't know. And it's not for you to determine if it's sin for them. It's, it's for you to determine whether it's sin for you. And again, you must, make that you must make that determination. Just because something's not prohibited in the Bible doesn't mean it's not necessarily sin. If, if uh, in your case indulging in that thing may very well violate many biblical principles, and so you have to make those judgments. But that's for you to make for yourself, not for them. Now, you can give them advice. You can offer your reasons why you think it's dangerous. You can say, look, I'm abstaining from this thing because I see this danger and this thing. Have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? And what about that, that, and that? And you can show them that, and they might be convinced. They might not be. Uh, you, can even, you can do that. You can even establish rules in your household. You can establish rules in your business. If you run an organization, uh, you can do that and establish policies. That's all fine. That, none of that is legalism. That's not legalistic. But you cross the line into legalism when you require other people to make the same judgment call that you make spiritually in some gray area. That's one kind of 
legalistic judging. There's another side to that coin, though. There's another kind of legalistic judging that sometimes people don't realize. It's legalism for you to look down on a guy who's less strict than you. We all understand that's legalism. But did you know it's also legalism to look down on the guy who's more strict than you in his judgment calls? Maybe you're the one who feels perfectly free to drink and smoke and break all kinds of traditional tra taboos. Uh, and, and, and somebody else, you see other people abstaining from all that, and you say, what a legalist. You know, he probably thinks he's better than me. He probably thinks he's better than everybody, and he's all these strict rules. What a righteous, self-righteous, goody-goody legalist. Or maybe you see a person like that, and you say, what a dope. He did, doesn't he know that's not in the Bible? Doesn't he know we have we're freedom to do all this stuff? And he's tied to these rules? What a moron. He doesn't understand grace. That's also legalism. It's just as legalistic as the first guy. If you look down on the one who calls it in a less strict way or in a stricter way, it doesn't matter. Either way, it's sinful, legalistic judging. Romans 14, very clear. In, in Romans 14, the issue, one of the issues was, had to do with whether to eat meat that had been sacrificed to an idol, and you're getting it on sale now and all that. And Romans 14, through, seriously, that's what they would do. They, they had to do some of the meat, and you get it cheap. So the Christians had a dilemma. Well, should I do that? I don't want to participate in idolatry, but it is a good deal, and, you know, what should I do? So it was a judgment call, and Scripture didn't say one way or the other. And so Romans 14.3 says, The man who eats everything must not look down on the one who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted them. He's accepted both. Both are doing what they're doing to honor Christ, and so both are accepted by Christ, and neither one should be looked down on. Wherever you come down on that judgment call, it's legalistic, judgmentalism to look down on someone who comes down in a different place. Verse 4, who are you to judge someone else's slave? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. What are we doing evaluating each other? Why do you drive home on Sunday after church and talk to your spouse about what a poor job someone else in the church is doing? Is that your person your slave? Do they answer to you? Are you in charge of value? Did you die on the cross to purchase them so now you own them and now it's your job to evaluate how well they're serving you? Who are you to evaluate someone else's slave? I think this verse is fascinating because it implies that the only person that you're allowed to judge is somebody you own. As a slave. You, if you don't own that person as your own personal slave, then you have no business evaluating how well they're doing as a slave. Because they're not serving you. When we do that, when we judge people, we are usurping the place of God. James 4.12, there is one lawgiver and one judge, one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? That's God's job. So, either way, it's legalistic judging. So that's, that's one form of sinful judging, is judging legalistically. Number two, second form of sinful judging is judging superficially. Jesus told the Pharisees in John 7, 24, Stop judging by mere appearances. Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. When you pass judgment on someone based on external appearances, you will tend to always render wrong judgments. One of the, one of the, uh, I think, most all-time most beautiful acts of worship ever recorded in, in human history took place in Luke 7 when that woman anointed Jesus' feet, remember, with her tears and wiped his feet with her hair. What a beautiful picture of worship. That woman had repented of her sins. She had been cleansed and transformed by the power of Christ. Her heart was as white as snow. Her worship was, it's the model of worship. It was reverent, it was effusive, it was selfless, it was courageous, it was enthusiastic, it was passionate, it was demonstrative, it was genuine, and it was an expression of deep gratitude and love for the Savior. Ideal worship. 
You won't find a more beautiful display of worship anywhere in the Bible. And the Pharisee who was there took one look at her and determined that Jesus must not even be a prophet, but otherwise he would know he wouldn't let such a sinful human being touch him. This guy, this Pharisee, wins the award for the most incorrect, one of the most incorrect judgments ever rendered. This guy is a really bad judge. How did he get it so wrong? He got it so wrong because he judged superficially. He didn't take into consideration what was in her heart, only what was in her past. The world thinks your past is what defines you. That's what psychology will tell you. You're defined, what you are is defined by your past. God says, no, no, what you are is defined by your heart, not your past. Judging someone by any other measure is superficial. So we, we, and we can't see the heart, right? So we're not in a position to judge. And so related to that is the third one on my list here, judging not only superficially, but judging self-righteously. Remember in Luke 18, Jesus told that parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector who went up to the temple to pray. They both went there to pray. And one of them went away justified, and the other one did not go away justified in the sight of God. It was the tax collector who went away justified and not the Pharisee, and it was the tax collector who was justified because he was humble and repentant, and the Pharisee was not. He was prideful. That's the parable. But listen to how Jesus introduces this parable in verse 9, Luke 18, 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray and so on. The Pharisees counted on their own self-righteousness. They had never committed any of the really gross, scandalous kinds of sins, and so they thought they were pretty good. And there's a tendency, tendency for those people who have have never, you know, they've, they've just had kind of a squeaky clean uh, life externally. They, they, they never committed adultery. They never stole anything. They never rebelled as a teenager. They never were tempted with homosexuality or anything like that. Never hung out with a bad crowd. Never got drunk. Never been high on anything. And uh, never been in a jail cell. And it's easy for people to, like that to fall into a mentality that looks down on those people who have fallen into those scandalous kinds of sins. And they think they're better because they've never committed any of the really big sins. The problem is, those aren't the really big sins. There are big and little sins. There are, contrary to what some teach, there are some sins that are more egregious than other sins. But God's list of what's really big and what's not as big is very different than what our list tends to be. Way up near the top of God's list of the really gross, wicked kinds of sins is the sin of self-righteousness. Thinking you're better than others because you haven't committed certain kinds of sins. Or thinking that you deserve credit for the fact that you didn't fall into those sins. You look down on someone who struggles with homosexuality or criminal behavior that lands them in prison or, or whatever variety of sin they struggle with that you don't struggle with and you look down on them for that, that is self-righteous judging. Do not judge that way. So we're not to judge legalistically, we're not to judge superficially, we're not to judge self-righteously. Now let's look at the fourth one, judging unmercifully. Matthew 9, there are tax collectors and sinners. Again, scandalous kinds of sinners, the really bad ones in their sight, who were repenting and they were coming to faith in Christ. They were believing the gospel and being saved. It was a glorious time and that was something that any good judge would be rejoicing over. But instead of rejoicing, they were criticizing Jesus, the Pharisees were, for eating with people like that. And here's Jesus' response in Matthew 9, 12. This is kind of funny. He says, on hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I love when Jesus says stuff like that to the Pharisees. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. <laughs> go learn this verse. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's a quotation from the Old Testament. Very short little verse they have to learn. For I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. So he gives them this homework assignment to go study this one little verse about mercy in the Old Testament. A very simple assignment. But then three chapters later, and this is where I think it gets funny, he busts them for not getting their homework done. 
chapter 12. They're criticizing the disciples again, and this time for picking grain on the Sabbath because they cared more about their rules than they cared about human beings and human need. And in verse 7, Matthew 12, 7, If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, that's that verse he gave him to study, you would not have condemned the innocent. If you just would have gotten your homework done, you wouldn't be standing here right now with me rebuking you again and making this wrong judgment. They routine, the Pharisees routinely made wrong judgments because they lacked mercy. They didn't understand that verse, I desire mercy, not religious ritual. Mercy is a crucial, crucial ingredient for making right judgments. When you really love someone, you judge them better. You're a better judge. You evaluate them. You give them a break. You evaluate them much differently than if you don't like somebody. When you love someone, you put the best possible construction on the things they do. You, you, you have all these blanks in your knowledge. You don't know. There's so many things you don't know. You don't know what's in their heart. You don't know their motives. You don't know what actually happened. You weren't there. And you, you fill in the blanks. When you love someone, you fill in all those blanks with positive assumptions instead of negative assumptions. And, and God absolutely requires us to do that when we judge anybody. You understand that? Listen to this horrifying statement, James 2.13. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not shown mercy. Raise your hand if you want to face merciless judgment at the hand of God. That's terrifying, isn't it? And the only way to avoid it is to have a heart that cuts people slack when you evaluate them. And that includes the people who have hurt you, who are hurting you. People insult you, they're insensitive, they're rude, they cause a problem in your life. You need to judge them mercifully. This includes your enemies. It includes your, you ready for this? Children. There are some parent-child relationships that have deteriorated to the point where the child feels like the parent is against them instead of for them. And in many cases, the child is right. In some cases, the parent cares more about winning the argument than about winning the child's heart. Think about those people whoever it is, whether it's your children or your enemy, whoever, the people just are way down at the bottom of your list right now. It's people that irritate you, bother you, whatever reason, you just, you just don't like them, you can't get along with them. Ask yourself, are you for them or are you against them? I mean, just be honest. Can you honestly say you're on their side? You say, well, what are the sides? Well, Satan is their accuser, right? Satan is their accuser. Whose side are you on? Their side or the devil's side? You know you're on Satan's side when you be become carping and caviling with persistent, petty fault-finding. You can't overlook anything. You, every, you, 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 find, you, see, you notice everything they do wrong. You don't notice what they do right. You just notice what they do wrong. When mercy is lacking, your evaluation of that person is going to become condemning and disapproving and disparaging and fault-finding and hypocritical, hypercritical, uh, and harsh and unfair. And you won't take into consideration mitigating circumstances. You won't cut them some slack for this circumstance, this factor. You don't have any appreciation for what hardship came along and made this temptation more difficult in their case. You don't have any compassion. You don't have any understanding. All you want to do is condemn. You know, if you're like that, if you're a judgmental person, you know what that comes from? It comes from blindness to righteousness. It comes from being blind to their goodness. The, the things that the Holy Spirit has done in their lives. Judgmental people usually pride themselves on being excellent judge, judges of character, and the irony of that is they're terrible judges of character. They think they're good. They think they're so good, such good judges of character because they can spot everybody's character flaws. But they're actually terrible judges of character because they're blind to people's virtues. 
They have eagle eyes when it comes to spotting weaknesses, but they're blind as a bat when it comes to seeing the good in somebody they don't like very much. Judgmental people are about as good at assessing character as flies are at assessing meat. Their attention is drawn to what is rotten. All right, number five, judging ignorantly. Judging ignorantly. Uh, we make terrible judges because we have no ability, again, to see the heart. We can't see w the, the one thing that really matters in assessing a person. We can't see motives. We can't see thoughts. We can't see affections. We're utterly ignorant about the most important factors that matter. We're like judges who render a verdict without having any evidence, without hearing any evidence, without even knowing what happened in the case. And we just render a, a, a judgment. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord appears. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. Till that happens, you don't know what people's motives are. You cannot judge the heart because you cannot see motives. You say, oh, yes, I can. I know why he did that. What if, what if the motives are obvious? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're obvious. No matter what kind of superhuman ability you have to read people's motives, God forbids you from judging anybody's motives. It doesn't matter if you guess right or wrong. Still, still forbidden. Even if there's an 85% chance that that guy had a bad motive for what he did, no, it's still a 15% chance that he didn't, and so you, you don't know for sure, which, mean, which means you need to assume the good motive. It's a possibility, and so you need to assume it. You're required to assume it. Otherwise, God will judge you without mercy. If a person loves to be up on stage, loves to be in front of everybody, he's always, in front, he's always trying to get detention, Probably, chances are, his motives are a sinful, prideful want, desire for self-glory. But you don't know that. You don't know that for sure. It could be that he has good motives. Maybe he just wants to reach a lot of people with the gospel or whatever. If a person criticizes you harshly, uh, they probably have an unloving motive. But not for sure. You don't know that. They might have had a good motive. Now, if you suspect a sinful motive, then just ask. Seriously, just go to ask the person, because you care about them. You don't want to see them falling into sin. So you go to them and say, hey, was this your motive? Um, is it possible that you're doing this because of this sin? And maybe they'll say, yeah, you know, it is. And you say, well, you need to know from God's word. That's, that's wrong. You need to repent of that. But if they say, no, that wasn't my motive, then you take them at their word. All right, number six, judging prematurely. Uh, sometimes we've got a pre preconceived I I idea of the situation uh, after we just listen to the tiniest little bit of information, we blurt out our judgment. We just pronounce judgment right there on, on the spot. Proverbs 18, 13, he who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Don't do that. Listen. Investigate. Premature judging is when you arrive at a conclusion without having enough facts. It happens all the time. It's amazing how often we do this. We just don't have enough facts to render a judgment. We think we know. We think we, ah, oh, that, that, yeah, ah, I can fill in the blanks. We think we're so good at filling in the blanks and we're not. This is especially a problem when you hear just one side of an argument. Proverbs 18, 17, the first to present his case seems right till another comes forward and questions him. I never even understood how true that really is until I started marriage counseling. You hear a wife tell about what her husband is doing. He's Charles Manson. I mean, he's, he's a monster, right? And you're just sure of it. You say, even if I take into consideration typical exaggeration and typical bias and typical overstatement, still, this guy is an animal. And, and, then, and, then, and then you talk to the husband, and you're like, oh, this is a whole different thing than I was even thinking. Think how often, though, that you don't get that opportunity to hear the other side. You only hear the one side. It is the height of folly to form an opinion without hearing both sides, and yet how often we do that. Judging prematurely. All right, so that's a half dozen 
examples of sinful judging. The kind of context, uh, the milieu that, that Jesus is in when he says, judge not, these are the kinds of things that a righteous person would have understood. But there's a seventh on top of these six that Jesus really zeroes in on, focus on this text, and that is judging hypocritically when you've got a log in your own eye. And we're going to get to that in verses 3 to 5, but before we get to that, we've got to get to verse 2. And verse 2 is, we don't want to skip over, because verse 2 is, Jesus has more to say here. He's not going to get to verse 3 yet, because he's got more to say to us about the consequences of wrong judging. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. There's a reason for that verse. You know, Jesus already threatened us with judgment in verse 1, but he's not content with that. He's got to give us verse 2. He wants us to think, keep thinking about this. What does this mean? There's a debate, actually, over whether this is referring to God or other people. Who is it that is going to treat you the way you treat others? With the, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you by whom? And some say, well, it's got to refer to God. I mean, Jesus is hardly going to tell us to worry about whether other people are judging, how other people are judging us. Who cares how other people? I mean, Jesus is constantly teaching in the gospel, don't worry about how other people are judging you. Don't, that's not how we... Uh, that shouldn't be our motive. What drives us in our behavior is getting other people to be favorable towards us. So, got to refer to God. The other side of the debate says, no, no, I don't think it refers to God. We think it refers to, to people because if it refers to God, what would this mean? Jesus is saying if you judge wrongly, then you're going to get that same measure back to you. What is, if I judge wrongly, God is going to judge me wrongly? Is that what it's saying? If I judge unfairly, God is going to judge me unfairly? How could this refer to God? He doesn't judge anybody unfairly or wrongly. So that's the, that's the debate. And I think uh, both sides of that debate have an excellent point. And if you combine both of those arguments, I think we can get at the meaning of what Jesus is really saying here. If you wrongly judge others, here's what I think it means. If you wrongly judge others, God will discipline you by allowing other people to wrongly judge you. So in a way, it does refer to God and other people. God is sovereign. Do you understand this? God is sovereign over whether or not people, you have favor in people's eyes or disfavor in people's eyes. God controls that. And he's, he very often uses the sinfulness of the people around you to judge you as a tool to discipline you as his son or daughter. That's one of his rods that he uses to discipline and I've felt that. There was a time in my life when I was under the chastisement of God, and during that time, I could find no favor in the eyes of anyone. And, and it, was, it was a time, people were spreading lies about me at that time, and everywhere I went, people believed those lies and would not listen to me. They wouldn't believe me. And it was so obvious that these things were lies. I thought I, I had clear proof that they were lies, but everyone, nobody was interested in looking at that proof. Everyone automatically believed them, wouldn't believe me, and it was, it was bizarre, really. It was like being in the twilight zone. I thought I was losing my mind. It's like, what is going on here? And then a very wise pastor told me something very simple. He said, Daryl, it sounds like God just isn't granting you favor in the eyes of men. And I don't know why I hadn't thought of it that way, but it was exactly what was happening. And when the Lord's discipline was over, about a, it was after it was like a year or so of that, and then after that, all of a sudden, it was like suddenly just someone just flipped a switch, and it was over. Out of the blue, all of a sudden, people just started being really reasonable, and they, were, they would believe what I said, and they listened to me, and they, did, they saw the lies for the ridiculous things that they were, and they, they, everything changed overnight without any explanation. And I just offer that as, a, as an example of how God can sometimes use wrong judgments from other people as a rod to discipline his children. Now, this isn't to say that it's always punishment for some sin when people are judging you and people are mistreating you. Uh, many righteous people have been wrongly judged for all kinds of reasons, including Jesus, and that wasn't any, any chastisement. Um, but it can be chastisement. So when Jesus says, in the way that you judge, you will be judged, I believe he's talking about God who uses men as a tool for his discipline. This is just one of the natural consequences built into sin. Right? 
There's just some natural consequences to sin. They're just kind of built in, right? You, you, you steal something, you go to jail. You misjudge, you get misjudged. It's natural. If you're the type of peop- person who just finds fault in people and doesn't cut people any slack, people are going to treat you that way. If you judge prematurely, people are going to judge you prematurely. If you judge without mercy, they're not going to show you mercy. If you nitpick, criticize, and focus on weaknesses and errors and mistakes and faults all the time, people around you who are normally very kind and very gracious to everyone else, it's not going to be long before they're going to be hard on you. Your boss, co-workers, teachers, people at church, family, especially family, especially your spouse. You can marry somebody who's absolutely the most gracious, most forgiving person you have ever met in your lifetime, and if you are critical with them over the years, eventually they will become that way towards you. You will train them to be that way, and you can destroy a righteous, godly person that way. And so the Lord calls us to be gracious and generous in our judging. And it's interesting to me that Jesus talks here about being generous in our judging right after this section on generosity with possessions at the end of chapter 6. In the Sermon on the Mount, you get get possessions, uh, uh, generosity, and then then judging. Uh, Those two sections in the parallel passage in Luke 6 are actually mixed together. Uh, Listen, let me read Luke 6, 37. Uh, Ask if this is talking about giving and generosity or if it's talking about judging. Verse 37, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And he goes on with that. You read that, and you think, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You're talking about judging? You're talking about generosity? It goes back and forth. He's talking about both together because... One of the most important expressions of generosity is generosity in judging, in the way that you judge. If you're generous with your money, but not with your judgments, if you're open-handed and charitable with your finances, but tight-fisted and grudging in your assumptions of people's motives, then you're not really a generous person. And it's ironic because that kind of generosity doesn't even cost you anything. I mean, being generous with money means you have to give away your money. you got less money. But being generous in the way you evaluate people, it doesn't cost you anything. Well, let's close with this. Why would you judge your brother? Do you own him? Is he your slave? Even if you did own him, and even if he did answer to you, Why would you be a hard master? Has the Lord been a hard master to you? Has your master in heaven been a hard master? Or has your master in heaven overlooked your foolishness and your sin and your rebellion and your disobedience and your stupidity and your folly and mistakes by the hundreds of thousands? Why would we be impatient with one another? Has the Lord been impatient with us? Or has he patiently endured our poor service and waited for us to change for years and sometimes decades at a time? Why would we be stingy in granting grace to one another? Has the Lord been stingy with us? Or has he done everything imaginable to cover over our sin, even at the cost of his own precious son? Brothers and sisters, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Get rid of all bitterness and anger and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as Christ, in Christ, God has forgiven you.